you're still here, lovely audience. And that's because you're very smart, because for our third and final panel today, our speakers will discuss one of the central pillars of COP28, how to fast track a just, orderly, and equitable energy transition while focusing on people, lives, and livelihoods. So I would like to welcome Stephanie Diaz to the stage who will moderate this session. Please give her a warm welcome. As global demand for energy grows, we must explore new strategies to ensure equitable energy access. This demands collaboration and a commitment to fostering sustainable solutions that expand energy access in last mile communities. So hello everyone, it is a pleasure to see you all here today and moreover it is my honor to get to moderate this panel from targets to actions accelerating the just energy transition. Now when we talk about energy justice what we're really talking about here is social and economic access to clean reliable and affordable energy and moreover remediating past injustices of our energy sector. So to talk about these topics with me today first of all we have Danielle Decatur the Director of Environmental Justice at Microsoft. She, she leads the Microsoft Environmental Justice Strategy towards a measurable positive impact on climate resilience and capacities of under-resourced communities. And then secondly, we have Roy Torbert, Chief Program Officer at The Third Derivative, a clean tech venture capital firm where he is um, a clean energy and decarbonization leader. He's passionate about, about tackling climate change, building diverse coalitions, and protecting natural spaces. So I want to start by first just reminding us like what we're working towards when we talk about a just energy transition. And just to give you an example of what a just energy transition means to me personally, you know, a just energy transition would be my grandmother who lives in rural Honduras getting access to clean, reliable electricity around the clock, right? Um, what does it, a just energy transition mean to the two of you? I'll start with you, Daniel. Thank you, Stephanie. Happy to be here today. Um, for me, just transition is focusing on equitable distribution of the benefits, the upside of the clean energy transition, not just minimizing harm from our energy sector. Mm -hmm. What about you, Roy? Yeah, thanks. Really, really great to be here. Uh, for me and my work focuses a lot on innovation and supporting startups. And I think we heard this from Dr. Kande Umkela this morning as well. There are so many pockets of innovation in the places of the world that are going to be hurt most by the ravages of climate change. We need to support them. We need to show them the pathway to being the icons of the path out of the dangers of climate change. And right now, unfortunately, the finance and the investment is not flowing to those parts of the world that, that are going to be hurt most. So to me, a just energy transition looks like flipping that. Mm -hmm. may, may I add to that too? Yeah. Because yeah. also these communities don't have a voice and the solutions that are moving forward. And in the work that we've done, we've definitely been you know, steeping ourselves in relationships with experts in climate justice, environmental justice. Those have, have been at the forefront of this work on the front lines for decades. Um, and these communities, we always talk about how under-resourced they are, and that is true. But also these communities have such tremendous resilience um, and solutions. And so that's what our program's all about, is enabling them. Great. So you mentioned socioeconomic benefits of clean and affordable energy. Can you give like specific examples of what we mean by that? You know, it's, it's good, but like, how is it good? Um, and how can we quantify and communicate these benefits effectively? Do you want to go yeah. first? Or? Sure. <laughs> uh, so I think it means a lot of different things depending on the context. Mm -hmm. So, um, some communities are paying, like in the U.S., are paying a lot of money on their energy bill every month. Um, you know, a, a huge proportion of their energy, uh, of their total income, um, also known as energy burden. So it might be reduced energy costs in some places. It might be access to clean electricity for the first time, in other places, um, and it might be uh, community ownership stake in renewable energy assets as well. Yeah, I think that's that's spot on. You you can't. There's no one size fits all to say. Here's the here's the menu, and the menu is going to work for everyone. I think the most important thing is to say to these communities, you know, the 
the kitchen perhaps has been under-resourced. You don't have all the ingredients there, but we're really gonna help try and fix that. And then it's not a preset fixed uh, approach. It's create what you wanna see out of your energy system for yourself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and now you all are doing the work of, of trying to make this just energy transition. So Danielle, I'm going to start with you because Microsoft has some very ambitious goals associated with this, right? Like just as an example, you, uh, Microsoft has a goal of 100% of its energy consumption, 100% of the time is matched to zero carbon energy purchases. Right. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about the progress that Microsoft is making towards this goal and how it maintains the principles of just transition when working on these mm -hmm. goals? Yes, um, and that goal is by uh, 2030, and then we also have an interim goal by 2025 to have 100% um, coverage of our load um, on an annual basis by 2025, um, and we're tracking towards that goal. And uh, the 100-100-0 goal has, you know, a, a lot of challenges because different geographies um, require different solutions. They have different transmission infrastructure. Um, and regulatory landscape that and to enable renewable energy. Um, but that's why um, I am strongly making the argument and my team has strongly accepted this premise that engaging meaningfully with communities is important to achieving those goals because you can only build infrastructure in communities that want you there. So if we enter into a community, whether we're building, um, enabling a wind or solar farm or we are building a data center, for instance, um, it's important that we introduce co-benefits um, and design with the community from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, can you give an example of that? Like, what, what does engaging with the community look like? Sure. So in uh, the early 2020, we formed a relationship um, in, with a bunch of U.S.-based environmental justice organizations, such as NAACP and Emerald Cities Collaborative. And they came, they took a chance on us, and we came together for, to form a learning community. And they learned a little bit about how corporate clean energy targets are really driving the energy transition um, just by sheer volume. And then uh, we learned we know what environmental justice communities are facing and those solutions um, that I mentioned earlier. And they were really have been our guides. And over time, we have built out that network as well. And we have other organizations we work with, like Sustain Our Future Foundation or um, globally, like Solidaridad. Um, and they are sort of our um, our emissaries in some ways to help us connect with communities and help us understand what's really needed there. Um, we had one small project called Zero Waste West Side in Atlanta. Um, it was a you know a small two hundred thousand dollar grant, but we worked with our network to con who connected us with three Black women led organizations in that were already operating in the area and already had strong ties to the community. And they used that grant money to develop a closed loop for food waste for low income residents in that neighborhood. And then that seed money helps them attract more funding from the uh, Georgia Drawdown after that. Mm -hmm. And then one of those organizations, Gooder, has now since become part of Microsoft's supply chain. Okay. Um, to service our office buildings there in Atlanta. So that's an example of how, you know, we partnered with community organizations. You know, we just said, we have some money. What do you think should be done with it? And then they told us. Mm -hmm. um, and then it has led to this um, enrichment of infrastructure and an ecosystem of action in Atlanta. Okay, wonderful. And then, Roy, you, you have been working on the Just Energy Transition Program. Can you give us examples of some of those initiatives that you've been a part of and how these initiatives are contributing to both a clean energy transition and the empowerment of local communities? Yeah, happy to, happy to. And maybe I'll explain a little more about my organization. It's a little less well-known than Microsoft, I'd bet. Um, <laughs> so I wear a few hats. The first, most directly, is I am the Chief Program Officer for Third Derivative. We are an accelerator and a funder of early stage clean tech companies. We now support 160 companies and that's represented across 100 countries. They're all working to try and advance a clean and equitable future. Um, they work in all sorts of technologies from batteries to public policy and permitting to uh, new sustainable materials and, and use of waste for building materials. 
I also wear a hat at Rocky Mountain Institute, which is the, the host organization for Third Derivative. And for many years there, I've been helping a lot of countries in their just energy transition plans, which I'll talk a little bit about. And then lastly, I am also a trustee of the Puerto Rico Green Energy Trust, which is the Green Bank helping to support Puerto Rico after its many struggles mm. post Hurricane Maria and the thousands of earthquakes that hit uh, Puerto Rico about a, uh, two years after the, the hurricane as well. Um, but really from that, that those perspectives, I think the just energy transition is a fragile one. Mm -hmm. It is um, one dependent on a lot of financing and money, mm -hmm. but it also needs a lot of community self-determination and finding a middle ground where there's enough of that shaping from the bottom up and enough of the support from the top down has never been easy. Um, a lot of my work in prior years has been with the government of Indonesia, which very luckily has, I think, a very powerful plan uh, announced uh, in Bali about a year ago. Um, called the Just Energy Transition Program, or the JET-P. Um, that's $20 billion, $10 billion of public money, and $10 billion of private money deployed for what I think of as a three-legged stool. The first leg is to retire coal assets. Indonesia has about 40 gigawatts of coal-fired power today and was planning to expand that quite significantly. Um, instead, this plan helps to retire a significant chunk of their current coal uh, with the full support of a community that is very, very invested in coal mining, which is mm. what makes this very so difficult, similar to the the challenges that South Africa faced a year prior. That second leg of the school is uh, of the stool is to procure the new clean resources that are going to support their economic growth, and a plan now set by the government for about thirty four percent of their energy to come from renewables, which is a very big increase from today. But the last and probably what I think of the the, the least known but the most important important, a common problem, is the just energy transition mechanism to help bring money and support into communities. Mm -hmm. There's uh, you know, many, many hundreds of thousands of workers in Indonesia who are threatened by this transition, whose lives and livelihoods are entirely dependent on the coal supply chain. And that those communities also need to determine for themselves what is the right mechanism. Is it job retraining? Is it investing in new industries that can help support? Is it transferring into other parts of the renewable ecosystem? Um, but that last leg of that the, the of the mechanism is really really important, and I think that helps tie it together and create not just that top down but also the bottom up solution. Absolutely. So I'm going to take a moment to welcome Nicole Seppi to our stage. Hi everyone. Sorry for being a bit late. The traffic was a bit <laughs> challenging, <laughs> despite no rain today. It's okay. You're not the first person that this has happened to today, so you're good. Um, Nicole is the Director of Energy Innovation at the Bezos Earth Fund. She is an advocate for accelerating solutions to address global energy and industry transition. Um, so great to have you here on the panel with us. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. Yeah. Um, Roy, continuing on with you for just a sec, can you um, give us examples of specific strategies or initiatives that their derivative has been involved with, um, in particular in relation to like vulnerable communities and how you can help there? Yeah. I mean, there's an example I use. It might not come as a surprise to this global audience, but uh, if you tally up today all of the solar installed in sub-Saharan Africa, and you compare that to all the solar installed in the uh, famously rainy and small country of the Netherlands, the Netherlands has mm. more solar. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's an equation we really need to flip pretty quickly. Uh, so our team is working to help uh, accelerate not only the companies who are currently in our portfolio from places like Africa and Southeast Asia, but also grow the amount of applicants and the amount of activity happening there. Um, so we provide an 18-month fully vir virtual program um, that allows folks to participate and has mentors and corporates uh, across the world helping to support these startups. But we also recognize that if you look at the volume of companies who are coming to us, um, it is really heavily weighted to mostly the rich world. And that's mm -hmm. a problem that we're trying to fix. So our outreach, our outbounds, the way we're trying to grow these communities, it really starts with listening and understanding the unique challenges that a startup in Lagos might face that a startup in Los Angeles wouldn't, and understanding how to use our support and our resources to bridge that gap. Absolutely. Um, Nicole, yes. so I would like to ask you, because you work with the, uh, the Bezos Earth Fund, and it'd be great to hear if there's a specific um, project or initiative supported by the Bezos Earth Fund that you're um, particularly excited about and how you think it can help make a difference in providing fair um, access to clean energy while tackling climate change. 
Certainly. So um, Bezos Earth Fund is quite a new philanthropy and we're focused on both nature and climate. But what we're aiming for, and you know, there's a large community of philanthropies out there, but what's quite distinct about us is we want to be quite bold and catalytic in the way we apply our philanthropy funds, particularly on in terms of how we can accelerate solutions in this decade. Mm. We're a strong view that this is not just about new technology, and new sort of processes and business models, it's actually a whole system change. And so what we want to do is is thinking, what is that end energy system we all want in a more green uh, economy? And let's accelerate things now in this decade and start delivering this end system we want now. Let's not wait beyond this decade. So there's a few things we do, and the way we do it is, like a lot of philanthropy, we're agile. So we like to apply different processes and different applications. So if it's all right, I might be bold to give two different examples just to give different illustrations. So something that we did very early on at the Bezos Earth Fund is we launched an initiative called Systems Change Lab. We worked with the World Resource Institute and various other partners. And it's what's really important here, it's about actually tra- um, plotting 70 different transitions that are needed to go where we want in the eventual society and end system we want to deliver. But it's also about plotting it where the tipping point is. Now, obviously, with the recent global, global stock take, we know none of us are on track for this. But what was really essential about this was making it sure it's open source. It didn't mean that you had to be a large organisation. It didn't mean if you're in north or south of the world. It really is robust data, scientific proven data, and it's open source. That was really at the core of our driver. And so I do highly recommend you. It's an open website. They've actually just released another report. They'll come out later this year at COP. And it's all about tracking the different transitions. And there we work quite closely with the World Resource Institute. Another example we're very proud of is the GAP, or Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. It was created just nearly two years ago. It was founded by three philanthropists, ourselves, IKEA Foundation and Rockefeller. It was about three philanthropists coming together to say, what could we do to really accelerate a more energy just system in the developing world, focusing particularly on energy power? And it has three core ambitions, one particularly focusing about accelerating green jobs, one about reducing the emissions and making sure we are delivering more a completely green economy. But the uniqueness here is that it's always great to work with other philanthropists, but the uniqueness of GAP is that we're also creating an ecosystem. It's about alliance. It's about working with multilaterals. It's about working for institutions like IRENA, RMI, all the wealth of talent and data out there. But it's also getting a variety of different partners together. And it's really thinking about what are the new models? What's the new systems we need to do to really accelerate that? And because we're philanthropy, we can take a bit of a higher risk. So we're happy to sort of be agile, but take a little bit more high risk, sometimes first loss as well, and really test out a little bit of more models. So for example, to your earlier point, um, and GAP has got many programs, but if I could just give you a couple of illustrations. For example, mini grids, looking at certain parts of Africa who do have not any access to energy and looking at how we could implement mini grids at a cost effective manner to try and give them access, but also build up capacity and local communities then own and buy into these solutions. Um, Another, for example, a solution is we're looking at things like how do you actually look at agriculture and use renewables to innovate agriculture, so like solar pump heats and things like that. And there's multiple programs that GAP's doing. But the charm of GAP, and we're not alone, so but it's just an illustration, is that it's this alliance. It's about whether it's the World Bank or IFC, but it's also bringing smaller um, institutions, it's bringing different experts together to really come together in a partnership. And if I may say, it's the time to think about how do we execute? It's not just about coming together and having headlines. We should stop rewarding the industry that just comes out with headlines. Mm. We should reward those that execute. 
Now, I'm not saying we or the ones we partner are always going to succeed, but we're willing to give it our best. And sometimes we do need to make some mistakes to learn from that, to regroup, because we are philanthropy and we're happy to take certain high risks, especially on the technology side and R&D investments. So, you know, sometimes there is loss. But it's actually about that execution. So one thing I would encourage, and it's not just this week at New York Climate Week, but it's us in the industry, is that let's us as a community really hone down on those that execute, let's raise their voices. We don't really actually raise a lot of those voices. And those that just come out with targets, well, they're not really part of the solutions. So we really need to rethink who are our partners and who are the best people we should collaborate with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's that's a very interesting point because, I mean, everyone's always going to say collaboration and partnership is important, exactly. right? Um, because it is. Yeah. But we should be very honest and open about who those partnerships are with, what we're trying to achieve through those partnerships, right? Um, we don't have infinite capability for networking all of the time, but it's important to make sure that we put in efforts into um, thinking about, you know, who are the partners that are going to help us achieve our goals? How can we be aligned? What can each one of us mm -hmm. contribute? And it's been interesting because all of you are coming from a, a different perspective, right? We're talking philanthropists, venture capitalists, I'll call you corporate sustainability. Yeah, procurement. Procurement, sure. Yeah. Corporate procurement. So mm -hmm. different functions, but partnerships is critical yes. to each of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, sticking with you for a second, Nicole, can you tell us, you know, we, we've, we've heard a lot about what you guys are doing to date. Let's, let's think about what we want to do going forward, as you just prompted us to do, right? Mm -hmm. So what are some of the lessons you have learned from your partnerships that you've had with Breedla Bezos Earth Fund? And what are some of the lessons you want to take as you move towards making new partnerships or move existing partnerships forward? Yes, yeah, sure. So, I mean, if I may just reinforce yeah. the point you just said, mm -hmm. it's really about authenticity. Mm. And, you know, we are transparent, but we've got to sort of walk the talk a little bit. And that's on all of us. It's on myself as well. We are a community and we're only going to succeed if we go together. But it's also about um, finding that fine tune, whether it's between the financing, the risk or the expertise. But it's not just finding partners that have got the skills to put it together. You also want the will that they want to find a solution, <clears throat> meaning that, and I'm sure you see it in the industry as well, People have intentions, but they're still coming to these negotiation tables with their top 10 points. And if we really want to execute, there's a little bit of give and take we have to do. And we really need to do a little bit more strategic giving and taking to really execute that execution. But I think with partnerships, you've got to think about who are more aligned in the sense of your open thinking, your honesty, you know, let's be honest, you look at your setbacks, you learn from them and you've got to move forward. And you're also looking for ones that everyone's going to add value. Mm -hmm. And if I may say, it's lovely to be around with people with similar views, but it's even more exciting if you're around with disruptive views. And so you want positive disruption. You want people who are going to challenge you and vice versa so that end product, the end project or the end system will be the best you can as a collective to execute and deliver to the industry. Mm. What's a positive disruption you've experienced? Well, I think, oh, look, there's lots of positive disruptors, <laughs> really. But um, if I may, look, if I can go to, for example, GAP um, and their work, really, is that, you know, when GAP was formed, it was formed about focusing on access to energy. So these three philanthropists came together. And you could think traditionally, three philanthropists, you know, who are especially two that have very long history, we're quite new, could just go and do exciting things together. But we needed to change that dialogue and we needed to change that system. And if you don't mind, it was a way to be transformative influencer on some of the stakeholders too. None of us can achieve it on our own and we're not saying anyone's got all the answers, but there's a way we can sometimes, you know, challenge or influence others in a positive, uh, progressive way. And in that mindset, it was really that GIAP mentality of creating that alliance, mm. creating different stakeholders who are all part of the ecosystem and are part of that future. But it's also you sort of want to in, um, entice each one to step up a little bit. And I think when you create a little bit of that ecosystem, 
when as opposed to just individuals, you actually encourage each other to be part of that innovative solution. And in that very short time of GAP, and again, we've got a lot more to do and we're very excited about it, but we actually see that everyone comes with their expertise. But what I find really encourageable is we're not all coming with our corporate hats or with our institution hats. We're coming with the mindset of this is the issue, this is the solution or the final uh, delivery we want to address. How can we all work together? And I think that is a real positive element that we need to find people who've got that similar mentality. Absolutely. Now, Roy, mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as part of my work at, at Bloomberg NEF, you know, we track the activity of different climate tech startups. And of course, we're also tracking across different metrics. And one of the ones we look at is by, by region, by country, right? And something that I consistently see is that um, startups domiciled in the US take a good chunk of that pie. Um, and, the, and then comes startups in China, take up another good chunk of the pie, and then there's the rest of the world, right? right? Um, so that's something that we know if we want to have a just energy transition, we need to enable innovation globally. It can't just be in the US or in China, right? So I'd like to hear from you about what some startups are experiencing in developing countries. What, what are the barriers that they are facing what are things that can be done to address it? Yeah, it's a great question. Maybe I'll step back for a quick second and then answer it, which is, you know, we talk a lot about innovation. This is very well put, like we need to get real results. Mm. And I think one challenge we face is that I hear this debate, I've heard it a lot actually already in the mm. couple of days of Climate Week, is do we need scale or do we need innovation? Mm. And mm. the problem is that question in and of itself is flawed, yeah. exactly. right? Folks are saying, no, I've got a proven technology and I want to mm -hmm. take it to gigawatts or gigaton scale. And then folks are saying, nope, I've got a new technology and I need to get it out to the market as mm -hmm. fast as possible. Mm -hmm. When we break innovation apart, you actually see that the question doesn't quite make sense because we think of innovation in three big ways. The first way is probably the classic in a textbook you'd read about, you know, the breakthrough innovation, the, the fusion um, that's mm -hmm. going to change our entire energy system, right? Mm -hmm. Solid state cooling, all these things that um, are, I think are really important to advance and they're going to mm -hmm. fundamentally change the game. Then you've got the ones that are what we think of as probably the most important. They're the ones that help accelerate other deployment, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if we solve long duration energy storage challenges, we're gonna procure a lot more renewables today, mm -hmm. right? That's a, that's a given. So that's, a, that's an accelerant to the rest of the system mm -hmm. that's starting to innovate. And circularity, in, please. Oh, yeah. just saying, and yeah. circularity solutions to enable um, you know, the, the groundwork because yep. we do have a limited supply of these raw materials that yep. are gonna go into these storage solutions, et cetera, True. too. Yeah, Sorry, and then no, but then the last yeah. was we think of these, the innovations we know we will need for the end game, right? Mm. There are sectors in our economy, steel, aviation, yes. shipping, many of these yep. that we can project and say, mm -hmm. really hard to electrify, hard to figure out exactly what our solution set is. So let's start today mm -hmm. yeah. for this critical decade and solve those. Mm -hmm. But that, that middle category of innovations that are gonna help scale, they require a deep knowledge of what's stuck in the system today. Mm -hmm. Right, you can't just export an American company to Indonesia mm -hmm. or uh, Kenya and say we know how to solve the stuck parts of your equation and accelerate your renewables transition. It's just that those those components aren't going to work well. So there's a few chunks of the ecosystem we're really trying to help support and are are actively growing our work in Africa and Southeast Asia with support mm -hmm. of many philanthropists. Is to say. A, there's a great diaspora, right? Many of the, the folks who've gone to Oxford or uh, the, you know, the, the UK and the US situation are just dying to take their expertise and bring it back to their home country and say, now my startup can work on problems that I grew up with. And then secondly, there's many, many folks who just don't have access to fly to New York and come here and fundraise for their True. startup. And so how do we get the exposure and speak in their medium mm -hmm. to say, here's how you can access the startup accelerators we have and the funding sources and bring those resources that are unfortunately now a little weighted to the rich world, mm -hmm. disproportionately start them and finish them in the world that, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to drive both the emissions and the impact of climate change in the future. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I know, you know, I know that Microsoft, a lot of your environmental justice work has been really U.S. focused. And it's obviously not a matter of just taking things that work in the U.S. and going, hey, boop, now it works somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not actually the lesson we should take away. Mm -hmm. But obviously you do learn things through doing. So what are the lessons that we should be taking away? Yes, and it's really related to some of Roy's last remarks about scaling. And that's, that's my job is to 
because we, because we have these aggressive renewable energy goals, we need to be signing power purchase agreements on the hundreds of megawatts level, yeah. right? Um, and so it's my job to take those scaled solutions and make sure that we can um, there's an equitable and just approach to it. Um, one of the solutions uh, in PPAs that we uh, started with in the US is really transferable globally, and it's just the concept of a community fund. So it's basically building in philanthropy to Ooh. the power purchase agreement, to the price that we pay. Um, and those community funds, um, you know, I, I really appreciate um, your organization's approach to this, and I, I, I like to think we're aligned in that. Um, it's not just business as usual philanthropy. Um, you know, we have learned a lot from our environmental and climate justice partners about what a just and equitable fund distribution process looks like. So um, we uh, co-created a measurement and evaluation framework for the grants that come mm -hmm. out of the um, community funds. And just to give you an, a notion of scale, the first PPA that we signed, we call it an equity PPA. Um, the first one that we signed with Soul Systems was for 500 megawatts, and it's going. We publicly announced more than 50 million dollars um, would be uh, generated in a community fund. It will be more than that because of the way prices have gone up because it's a percentage of the project revenues. We did write a paper about it with contract language. So if anyone here knows anyone in corporate renewable energy procurement, please check it out because. We wanted to, you know, we want folks to iterate on the model. But so the community fund distribution is guided by this measurement and evaluation framework. And the framework really prioritizes community led solutions. Mm. Um, and those with real tangible benefits also that are hyper localized. And then we also have a governance process around how those funds are distributed, uh, which in which the decision makers about how the funds are made, uh, how the grants are made um, are the decision makers are representative of the communities that we're trying to positively benefit. Um, and so we've learned a lot through that process and um, we've, you know, we have a framework now for how we identify third party, um, third parties that can help us run a governance model so it's not Microsoft deciding where the money is and picking winners, you know, because um, the whole, the, the, something that I've really learned about this work is that it's not just about the outcomes, those outcomes are super important, of course, but it's about the process by which you achieve those outcomes mm -hmm. and having that be really mm -hmm. just and equitable. Mm -hmm. So can you, Stephanie, oh, sorry, I, I compliment that. Call. And if I could just add to, it's all about that system change, isn't yes. it? But in that system change, at the core is creating also more of an equitable justice society. And what I like, for example, through that illustration of Microsoft is that it's at its core, I think we need to question some things when it's just an add-on. It should never be an add-on. It has to be at the central core because we're talking about that end system, those future, you know, world and what our future generations we want to give to, and it really needs to be at the central discussion as well as the program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we're taking what we've learned through those big power purchase agreements and um, innovating different types of contract structures mm. to enable distributed generation, mm. because that's really going to be an important solution in a lot of emerging markets, for instance. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're, when you're talking about systems, you know, and wanting to create systems change, I mean, part of it, I hope, is the goal is that, you know, if we simplify and figure out a good process, we can replicate it, right? Like I imagine that's some of the lessons you've learned. Once you figure something out that's really hard to do the first time, mm -hmm. it's easier to do the second, third, fourth mm -hmm. time. Um, but we don't exist in a vacuum. We exist in a set of policy and regulations yes. and things like that. So it'd be interesting to hear from all of you, you know, what are some of um, the policy and regulatory recommendations you have that would help in terms of creating this just energy transition? Yeah, I might, I can jump in here yeah, first, sure. if you don't yes, mind. Please. <laughs> So, and I, there's a, uh, tomorrow is a pretty uh, painful uh, occasion in that we'll mark the sixth anniversary since Hurricane Maria hit mm -hmm. Puerto Rico, uh, mm -hmm. which was one of the deadliest climate fuel disasters in United States history. Um, I think what a lot of people don't recognize, and this sort of speaks to the systems view, is that also means two weeks ago was the uh, six year anniversary of Hurricane Irma, which was also one of the most powerful hurricanes that also hit Puerto Rico, and both hurricanes hit a number of other countries across the Caribbean basin. Mm -hmm. And so that was part of my work for a number of years and continues to be a, a big part of my support to the, the Green Bank in Puerto Rico, that 
those moments, especially right after the hurricane, exposed that the adaptive capacity of the system, the entire Caribbean system, was just massively exceeded. Mm -hmm. uh, many Caribbean countries participate in an agreement to share resources. So after any hurricane or disaster, uh, lines people will fly from one country to another and also bring with them bucket trucks and other electrical system infrastructure to put the grid back up. Mm -hmm. But when that many countries were hit by Cat 5 hurricanes in a short period of time, there's just simply not enough adaptive capacity in the system to respond. And so I think the policy and regulatory reality, unfortunately, and we're seeing this in Hawaii and Libya and lots of other places at this current moment, is that we will not be able to respond and improve the system from a stable spot. We are entering the period where climate disruption is upon us, and we have to assume that our communities are going to be struggling with some version mm -hmm. of strain, whether it's climate uh, disrupting supply chains and fueling inflation, whether it's immigration mm -hmm. and internally displaced persons because of climate, all these are going to make the policy and the regulatory challenges of today that much harder. That's not a great, like, simple answer for the policymakers out there to, to work with, but I think we are seeing innovations. And certainly the IRA is, I think, bringing a justice element to this, which is powerful. I think the way that we see regulators starting to respond, and I'd really commend the Hawaii PUC for their thoughtfulness on this, Absolutely. is understanding that you can't, you can't presume a stable state. You have to work with the, the disruption that's around us today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very nice. Mm. Oh, I, I'll just say, the grid. We need transmission. Um, we need uh, a pathway to interconnection um, in the in the U.S. Like this is very energy specific in the U.S. market, but like PJM interconnection issues, you know, I think are uh, really demonstrative of uh, processes that create barriers for community. Um, owned renewable energy, right? So if you don't have like a whole suite of, uh, you know, energy industry experts, like if you're a nonprofit organization that wants to have, you know, our public power authority, uh, you know, or tribal entity that wants to have own their own community uh, renewable energy infrastructure, there are so many barriers to that, even just through the internet connection process in the U.S. And we're just going to need, um, you know, grid reliability um, in an equitable way as well. Um, you know, when you look at extreme weather events where power outages are happening, it's in low income neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and I think a pathway to that is, is data actually. So just having that like, and again, sorry to use another US centric example, but um, for US like uh, the data at the census block level for grid reliability would shed a lot of light on where we really need to make grid improvements um, if we're really talking about just transition. Mm -hmm. And maybe just in concluding comments to that question, I mean, policy is vital, but the challenge with policy right now is how does it keep up pace with the changing of the times? And I guess that's always been a fact, but now it's even more vital than normal. And so for things like, especially from a philanthropy perspective, where we want to collaborate and sort of looking at the developing world, we're trying to see if how we could build up more capacity at that policy and government level to make sure that there's local ownership because policy is important, but policy also has to reflect their country and their local needs as well. Mm -hmm. And making sure that the local people are part of the voice there, not just uh, the policy and the policy makers, but also the community, the inputs into there. But I think also, you know, we need to recognise policy is vital, but also we don't have to wait for policy to progress innovation. And I think that's a given in the last decade, but even more, we can really go forward. And in some ways, it's nearly a lesson learned to policy and vice versa too, which is a wonderful ecosystem we're creating. But especially in philanthropy, we've got that agility, and I'm sure others do too in the system, but we've got that agility philanthropy to really sort of try and instigate new things, especially looking at demand and supply of how things should go in different areas of this uh, sort of end to end system we're trying to deliver and so in that ways it's sort of also making sure that we share our knowledge that is science-backed 
and open source with our policy um, experts as well. Because let's be honest, you've said it's so reliant on data and we can't expect all policy makers in the world to have all the data. It's a variety of people. It's Irina, it's BNF, it's lots of wonderful experts out there. It's yourselves as customers and consumers, it's big corporations. And we need to make sure the data is science checked and everything, but we need to make sure it's out there and more people have access both on the business, the executors, the entrepreneurs and the policy to make sure then they can go forward and sort of deliver those solutions we need. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Now, I know we're like about to run out of time, but I've got one last question for you all. Um, because Roy, you mentioned the tension that some people think there is between scale and speed. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes when people hear partnerships and collaboration, they are excited, but they also think, oh my God, that's so many people to bring on board and that can be daunting. <laughs> mm. So if you had like one piece of advice that you'd give, mm. you know, how, how do you calm down those nerves when people hear, oh gosh, mm. we need to bring everyone on board? <laughs> yeah. It's a really tough question to put right at the tail end. I know. <laughs> I mean, I come to the proverb, right? If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Uh, the tricky part is we have to go fast and we have to go far and we can't leave people behind anymore. Yeah. And so I think the, the, the power that I've seen in the few instances where I've really seen this succeed is a pretty dramatic stepping back from egos and stepping back from positions. You know, sort of mentioned that like the folks who come to the table with their 10 talking points and their goal in the meeting is to read them down and try and, you know, hammer the rest of the, the room verbally with their talking points. That's the exact sort of discussion and collaboration mm -hmm. that I think impedes what we need. And so I think that release of the positions and mm -hmm. acceptance of the challenge as a first step, to me, that's the only mm -hmm. way we can get there. I might just add, if I may, and this is something I've learned from our advisors, our environmental justice advisors, is we can only move at the speed of trust. Mm -hmm. Good, well said. And I would just add, especially from a philanthropy perspective, is that we're very conscious. It's a live echo ecosystem we're operating in. So everyone's got a role. And for philanthropy, it's not just doing good. Obviously, we want to do good. It's doing more than that. It's in that live ecosystem. Where are the gaps? And what can we do to collaborate, but to really accelerate those solutions? So it's actually being quite strategic because the worst thing, particularly philanthropy can do, is do good, but you slow down that ecosystem because we're grant-based and we don't want returns on our actual funding. So we need to, and we are, and our collaborators in philanthropy are, but we need to be strategic in that live ecosystem. Mm. Absolutely. Yes. Well, thank you all so much. Everyone, please join me in giving them a round of applause. <laughs> thank you to our wonderful moderators, I think. <laughs>